talked about the, uh, the conversion pathway, some of the different technologies, and this will then lead into um, really Scott's discussion of uh, the Hawaii energy uh, situations, and, and uh, we'll talk more about, about uh, uh, some of the issues as we get through the day. But I just want to set the stage so that we all are on the same page here. So there's a lot of different ways of getting from that heat from the wood, the woody biomass. Uh, we already talked about the cost of production, you know, collecting it, transporting it. We get it to some facility where, facility where we're going to now um, convert it into energy into this stuff. There's a lot of different pathways to, to get there. The thermal control conversions, the most common one is the combustion system. It's the power plant that are the most familiar, where you take wood and you burn it, you produce heat that makes steam, steam runs a turbine. Uh, 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 electricity through uh, generate uh, rates electricity. So that's the most common one. There are other technologies, gasification uh, is where we actually are converting the gas and then that gas, which would be you know comparable to a like a natural gas but a much lower energy value. Um, so you have now a fuel in a gas form that you put into some kind of a system to uh, it can go directly into an engine engine that is connect connected to a generator to make electricity. And that only can go into also take that product into fuels through some other convert it into basically organic. Okay. But it is another pathway where as well. Hollisys is a, is a little bit uh, a chemical where you're converting wood, kind of a mixture of a liquid and a gas. Not just uh, this, this one is just through really a gas. Hyrox is giving you a liquid of water, if you will, and, and, and a gas. Another pathway, we'll talk more about that, and it can also be uh, directly be by, by burning that product converted into higher value fuels through some other processes. I have conversions where we can take wood and break it down with chemical um, hydrolysis piece where you break wood down into individual component sugars and ferment those sugars with yeast and produce alcohol. So that's a, a common method of making alcohol. Um, it's the way you make vodka. You break down um, your potato into sugars, and then you ferment the sugars, and you make it in the process. So that's another conversion method. And in the bacteria working on wood can break down and really break down wood over a longer period of time. It's not as fast as the enzyme has acted, but it can break down the wood to those individual components. Individual components and uh, produce a gas out of from anaerobic digestion. Um, Biophotolysis is a much more, it's a, basically, it's a, it's a, a light break of biological materials. And then higher, higher value product, higher cost technologies to convert wood into a uh, combination of heat, pressure, catalysts, uh, sophisticated technology. We're really going to focus on some of the things that we in this discussion. But basic pathways to really any of those products on the right side, it really comes down to um, theory. Some are in practice than others. There are you know, solutions and there are economic issues with them as well. Yeah, that's not a simple answer. Sure.
a lot of this is still in research. Many of those networks. Just a simple comparison of the fuels to the fossil fuel. Um, and again, just pointing out the fact that the fossil fuels are a better, more energy dense uh, product, and you can get higher value. The higher energy content out of those fuels. Wood were a lower end of solid wood compared to coal. Or quite a lot of energy per pound. Process that gives you that bio oil and it would be in the seven BTU per gallon. Well, it's a different ballpark. And in fact, Bio oil and the diesel oil you know, might work well together, but the diesel oil, so you have to do other conversions to mix it with the diesel oil. So uh, difficult to work with. That uh, gas work quite well on a smaller scale. It's a very low energy kind of gas. We're making a gas to burn. Um, to, to uh, you know, drive, um, do some other sort of combustion process. So it's quite low in energy um, compared to natural gas. Um, so you're not getting a lot of energy in gas. So just keep that in mind. It's not, again, there, there are no simple solutions, but there are. And it does make for those other reasons to use. Go this route. Real simple. Uh, run through these processes just so you have a better sense of how the combustion is, is the one you're all familiar with. This is about a see that this is about a I think that's a 20 megawatt power plant power plant where you feed fuel source and the it takes place in part the boiler and the generator over here and this is a big part of it. What we're doing is we're combusting wood. The water is the combustion products and producing the heat for combustion. That's the thermic process. Oxygen, nitrogen, ash is the inorganic element. Um, that are in the ash part. What matter? Tiny little particles. Basically, they smoke with you. And carbon monoxide and all the products. Big part of it is cleaning up those particularly particulate. Does that make sense? <laughs> a big deal because the particulate matter um, needs to be well, We see electrostatic precipitators here that are. That are cleaning up the uh, air stream. The thing to do is a bit of the process. So once you heats water in the boiler, produces the steam, the steam generator produces electricity, or you can take the heat directly um, to heat a space heating source. If you can use that heat and the steam for the energy together, that uh, generation, then you have a better, uh, more efficient. And you can see that in the forest products industry with sawmills that have a autonomous power plant for burning their residues and for these residues or these ag residues, whatever their low value fuel is, um, they produce electricity, but they also can be used in the dry kilns to drive the value they're going to the heat using them. I'm just trying to think. Of I was looking at it. I think it is. It's, it is a 51. But, but just the two stacks there. I mean, it's, it's more like a 51. I don't know. Uh, Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's it. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. 
Well, uh, yeah. When you talk about coal, I mean, the wood, we're talking about 50 megawatts. It's the biggest one we have in California. When you're talking about a coal power plant, I mean, there, I, I, I can't remember the number, but it's, it's huge. It's, it's, right, so there you go. So, yeah, it's a completely different scale. So, they, uh, then the analysis process. This is a very simple pyrolysis process. Anybody know what that is? You see, it's a charcoal thing. <laughs> but it is a pyrolysis process. Pyrolysis is where you heat up the wood um, in an absence of air or oxygen. Very limited air, if any, or oxygen. So it's actually heating up the wood and producing this bio oil out of it. And it's also charring the wood, so you're getting charcoal. So that's the simplest process. So there are different ways of doing slow paralysis, fast part, a lot of different tweaks to the system. But what we have in the very fundamental charcoal kiln is a big smoke screen that has the bio oil in it and it has the particulates in it and it has particulates in it. So if we can take all of that and, and manage that, we can get oil out of that, condense the vapors basically in that. And you Oil. So the pyrolysis process is giving you that charcoal or ash component. And depending on what temperatures you are and how much oxygen is actually available, you can tweak this system to maximizing different products. And it's the same process that's used to produce the purified biomass that uh, is really a um, thermally uh, processed uh, wood into that charred material that has a higher energy density. And then we can uh, take the bio oil, for example, and it can be tweaked into, um, through further processing, into a, actually gasified at a higher temperature, start converting into gas, or it can go directly into combustion, burning that bio oil. Uh, or through other processes, we can make it into something that is uh, more compatible with transportation fuels. Um, like diesel. But that's an extra process. So, so these things are really um, technically possible, uh, really unproven in the market as to whether you can get to that transportation fuel that's good for you economically, but they certainly work. Um, they've been done for many, many years. This is the char and Charcoal and bio char. Does anybody know the difference? It's just the word bio. So whenever someone it's bio char, I think it's kind of a big talk. You know, it's kind of a buzzword. Where that big man different. <laughs> and so the guy getting seventy cents a pound for his char versus the guy who's paying to get rid of it in the landfill, it may he may have a slightly more refined and uh, certainly a better marketing program. The 70 cents versus the guy who's paying to get rid of it, in part because maybe it's just not the right texture. There's uh, some, some good marketing uh, human needs. So it's, it's certainly got uses. Uh, not all of the char is created equal, but it's, there's an amazing amount of, uh, of, of talk in this space about bio char, but in fact, you all know it as char. Yeah, that's, uh, you can take it with basically. <coughs> You're, you're, you're keeping the carbon, you can do it for a lot of other stuff. You, you can do, instead of take that and actually dissolve it into a higher value carbon product for you. Activated, activated charcoal. Yeah. So we have work with folks who are trying to activate the char coming out of the gas fires to raise the price and get a better market, a more consistent market. Because one of the things they found out was they can sell the farmer with char at 70 cents a pound or you know, bulk rate at 25 cents a pound. That farmer uses it once for his fields and won't necessarily be a return customer for years. And that kind of, every time you make a sale, you're not making the market doesn't uh, cycle through. So activated charcoal is something you can sell, comes back, they clean it up, they reuse it, you sell it again, it goes to the wastewater treatment market, and all, so on. So in the char itself, there's a lot of buzz, a lot of work. I think one of it comes back to, again, you know, the initial process and to get higher value out of it. The, the charcoal pretends that it's really good. 
Actually, it might just start all the head editors in the world. Uh, so, so I carry editors like add to the vertex. Some of it's consistent, Robert. Some of it's some nasty chemicals. Yeah, but you want to go to But it makes it hard to use. I use some of the So let's take uh, the pyrolysis process. The important thing here to remember is kind of an intermediate step in terms of uh, heat. Uh, 300 to 500 degrees um, centigrade now I'm talking about, not Fahrenheit, which is you know, very hot. It takes a lot of heat to convert wood into a liquid or to a gas. But if we go up to gasification, now we're talking about temperatures greater than 600 degrees centigrade, a much higher temperature. And in this case, we need air, we need oxygen to, uh, to get that final step from pyrolysis to gasification. When you look at a gasifier, the reactor, that this is a very simple one, updraft, a gasifier means it's updraft, it means that the air is going up, the feedstock's coming down, counter current. That's an updraft gasifier. A downdraft gasifier, the air and the feedstock will be going in the same direction. But inside, you have the same thing going on. Feedstock's being dried, and there it goes through that pyrolysis process where you're getting that pyrolysis gas and that bio oil. But then at higher temperatures, it's actually going through a reduction in oxidation reaction. They're converting that, those products of pyrolysis into this gas, which we call a product gas. You hear the term syngas thrown around a lot. Syngas is really taking that and cleaning it up and getting a, a, a better gas out of it. But what's coming out of the gas part is the product gas, producer gas. Basically made up of carbon dioxide, nitrogen, Hydrogen sulfide, ammonia, parts, and water. The tar is something you can't forget about because the tar producing the gasifier creates a lot of headache. It has to be cleaned up if you're going to go to any higher value uses. Um, you can go directly, burn that product gas directly. Remember, it's a low energy content gas. You can burn it directly, produce the heat, steam, or energy through that route. Or we can take it into internal combustion engines. There's some gasifiers, maybe you don't have to clean it up. Maybe the engines can, internal combustion engine can handle that tar in there, but it's going to be a, a maintenance issue. Best to clean up the tar. And uh, if you run into these kinds of higher value uses, definitely have to get the tar out. So it's an extra step in the process. And, but it is a pathway that is becoming quite popular, uh, particularly on the smaller scale. There are different ways of, of running those gasifiers. Um, the oxidation fluid, what you use, uh, the air um, in that example I showed you before this, the air intake which is needed for these reactions to occur. It can either be air or it can be oxygen and, um, <clears throat> with a low oxygen content. You'll get a higher heating value if you use nitrogen instead of air. If you're using air, you're going to be at the lowest uh, heating value, about 100 to 200 BTU per cubic foot. There are other ways of, of uh, using steam and indirect rather than actually combustion. In this reactor, you're really burning wood. There's combustion going on in here that's producing that drives the reaction. You're not adding heat to it. But if you do the indirect method, then you're actually adding heat from a different source. Um, and you uh, can produce a higher value content. Technical difficulties here, hang on. Okay. And then the different kinds of gasifiers, downdraft, uh, updraft, we talked about those different the fluidized bed and then train flow are really the higher, uh, more complex system, but they do a better job of gasifying the fuel. And you can see that we talked about um, downdraft, fairly low tar, but it only really works on small scales. If we go to a larger scale, we have to get into these kinds of systems. Um, and uh, I have a little graph that will compare that later, kind of the tar production from those different systems. We talked about efficiency. Um, just to drive it home as a comparison of uh, the, you know, the, how much energy you put in to get a kilowatt hour out, comparing those heat rates, it's really a measure of the efficiency of the, the natural gas combined cycle, which is the 
for California's energy production, and it's running about 45 percent. Um, power plant neighborhood of 34, but the biomass fire 20 to 20 percent efficient. So we're a lot of energy in this process. Um, get, get a heat use out of that to combine heat and power operation, and you've improved your efficiency in that, which is an waste. Talk a little bit about the, the environmental impact. And I comparison between coal and natural gas, just so you get a sense of where it fits, where the biomass fits. You can see that um, we're producing more emissions, that are, these are emissions that, that, that are important in, in an uh, environmental standpoint. We're producing more in almost every category of natural gas, a lot less than coal. The thing to focus on here is the carbon dioxide. You actually get a lot of carbon dioxide out of wood, but if you buy that argument that this is carbon that will be going in the atmosphere anyway when wood degrades, deteriorates, you know, it's a non-fossil source compared to fossil fuel. Fossil fuel. So, um, but it really does quite well in most of the other categories. Not as good as that, but it's a much better, obviously, uh, fuel than than coal. You may have read, you know, there's been some controversy about some studies that were done that are saying that wood is a dirtier feedstock than coal, which is funded by the coal industry, I suppose. <laughs> These are pretty much, you know, reputable universities. What they're really looking at is this carbon dioxide issue. They're not looking at emissions when they're making that statement. They're trying to make more carbon dioxide out of wood than, than coal. Um, you have to look at that bigger carbon, full carbon cycle. In graphic form, just comparing wood to, yeah, it's not as good as natural gas. No question about it. The, the wood is the emissions from wood fired boiler, the blue is the emissions from, you know. so, and again, this particulate matter is, is one of the, the big. Issues you have to deal with the particulates that are coming out of the pipe. Uh, if you look, compare that. If you compare that to natural gas. It's dramatically uh, more particulates and very small particulates that affect the the, uh, the, the lung health. So you have to get those cleaned up in in low carbon, and that's a, a big part of the talk. Fire of biomass plants. Versus natural gas, you know, the slide like that. Yeah, you were this little runs are in the if you have, if you have best, if what she showed was mm -hmm. as if it, it, it should it should be like as if it wasn't being cleaned up. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, nobody ever puts it up. Well, yeah, well, you know, I'm so curious. I mean, if you clean up the plant, I mean, that's the whole thing about the emissions of the power plants. You get this done. Right. And I just wondered, yeah, if that's, well, Good idea if that's available. Because that's, that's why if I wanted to make a question on, on a conservation group in uh, the state of Google Mill, I saw that. What I wouldn't show was that you have to do that. Right. And so you wait. Well, you know, so the argument that you're trying to make. But this this, this is what's really happening. Yeah, you do have to clean it up. Trouble. But everybody knows that. I mean, that, that you don't build a power plant without knowing about how to handle the air conditioning, right? It's a start from day one. Um, just a very quick comparison of those gasifier types. The downdraft gasifier works well for smaller scale, but it doesn't scale up very well. But it can give you lower car, lower car production. Car is, is uh, is really the issue in these different methods. And I have a, another graph that I'll share with you. Car. Well, you get into the fluidized bed method, much better uh, conversion technology, uh, but you do have to, again, clean up that car. car. Um, sort of a, on the, that same information, a different scale, looking at the, uh, the best capacity for gas repairs based on um, their, their operating efficiency. Downdraft gas fires work well in that lower range of energy uh, capacity and up to about a megawatt, burning about up to a maximum of 12 bone dried tons per day. As we go up to scale, 
more fuel, bigger systems going up close to the eight um, megawatts capacity in the fixed bed, and that range up to 100 bone dry tons per day. The bed ones are the three in the middle, and then the train flow is a very large system. That's when you get to their, their designs up to 10,000 bone dry tons per day. So, cool. so, just to give you a sense of the scale, of the and then in terms of tar, um, you know, there are limits to tar and to the equipment that it goes into, how much tar they can really handle. I'm going to focus on that. This is what I really want to show you. The, the different kinds of gasifiers and their and, um, that uh, get into some very sophisticated gasification to get that tar down. But the other processes, the low temperature and high temperature gasification, the down draft gasifiers, kind of relative amounts of tar that they produce. Just the pyrolysis process basically is producing tar. That bio oil is the tar. Um, that's the highest. So kind of a good good way to compare the two systems. I want to focus in the next five minutes on this one. Um, a comparison now of different different systems for getting bioenergy, different pathways. Just some uh, com sort of general numbers that are a good way to compare this. Um, the capital cost, the typical size of these different processes, the capital. So this is all based on kind of California information, the history of the power, power industry in California. And then the production cost in terms of cents per kilowatt hour is the last one. So you can see that the capital cost on the Austin boiler and system runs in, in that range of $2,504,000 per watt. You know, uh, and uh, typical size is in that 20 megawatt in California. As Larry mentioned, we have three that go up into the 50 megawatt uh, category. Um, and then uh, if you look at gasifiers, um, a little bit more in capital cost, three to and the uh, steam boiler uh, combined with turbine and combined heat and power system, somewhere in the middle, about five to seven in capital cost. You look at uh, you know, the, the typical size of those systems, the, the whole project for this size of system, what the whole project would cost. Ballpark numbers, but it gives you a sense of what we're talking about for that kind of a, of a system and the size of it. I mean, these gasifiers, typically the downdraft gasifiers in that range of 50 kilowatts, 500, I'm sorry, 500 kilowatts to a megawatt. When we put all that, Kind of in a common denominator in per kilowatt hour, we're you know, ranging from nine to maybe twenty cents a kilowatt hour. Um, yeah. uh, to John, if you were to say for Hawaii, I mean, I just use arbitrary twenty percent more Hawaii due to the labor due to. Difficulties getting parts and supplies uh, and other stuff. So I would throw easily the cost of electricity that percent in the car. Great. Two times. How much? Twice. Twice. So you're talking uh, 40% more? Twice. That's, that's a good deal. <laughs> more minutes. Uh, gasification, we've talked about all this. Uh, you can uh, really focus on the, the systems that we have developed now are really working best at the smaller scale. They're very complicated at the larger scale. Uh, so there might be some real solutions for smaller scale gasifiers that can produce some electricity. Capturing heat off of a gasifier is difficult. All the gas coming out of the gasifier the reactor is very high temperature. 
Um, hard to capture that heat. Usually when people talk about capturing heat for another use, they're talking about the internal combustion engine heat system. But it's something to look at if you can use the heat uh, for that reactor, you can improve your economics, improve your efficiency. So they work well on small scale. We're starting to see some interest in developing those in California. I know of two that are operating um, that I'll show you in a later talk this morning um, that are smaller gasifiers that have a successful track record now in California. But we really don't see a lot of that. Yet. I think it's the way of the future. I think it, it produces a fuel that has lower emissions. What I showed those emissions were combustion emissions. If we produce the gas and then burn the gas, those emissions are closer than the natural gas emissions. So there's some real advantages in the gasification pathway. But we're not there yet for a large scale. Um, but you can uh, get some real value out of the gasification process. So simply pros and cons. Combustion, it's been around for a long time. It's a fairly basic process. Um, and they make the case the gaseous emissions are similar to those of decomposition of wood. The biggest problem with it is the particulate emissions and uh, the low efficiency. The thing we hadn't talked about is uh, you have strict boiler operation requirements that go along with high pressure steam boilers um, that is just an ad added operational cost. Um, things we always have to be concerned about, availability and the cost of the fuel, the emissions are a complicated story and again referring to that carbon cycle whether you buy that argument or not that um, the, the carbon we're emitting is being used by the trees again so it's a closed cycle of carbon um, and uh, we're going to see higher maintenance costs and again those grid internet challenges pyrolysis produces a you know a, a fuel that uh, can go into an engine um, but it has a um, it's a very complex mix of organic chemicals, and it's not compatible with other fuels and you do a lot of, of other processing to it. Um, the similar, the, the char hits some of the values um, that will be in some cases. And it's relatively low cost operation, but still have untested market for the char and the, the bio-oil itself, but fully untested. But it's a process that's getting some interest. Uh, the gasification, we talked about the uh, reverse gas that can be used for a lot of other things, the processing steps, including taking it to uh, syn gas, which would be then using cattle to get into other very high value chemicals. So, uh, complicated process, but it works quite well. Um, then we get lower our emissions, and then our, our char ash may actually have the, the residue, may actually have some value as well on that. But it's a low BTU value gas, and the high protection in that car has to be dealt with. Uh, I wanted to end at 10.30, and if 